There was always the temptation to make the Soviets 10 or was it 12 feet high at a time when we knew that our own average height was about five feet. Among the many weapons the Soviets had prepared in the event of a war in Europe were uh, street signs in Cyrillic. Oh, it could have happened. It could have happened. I mean, who can tell? Whether he is a soldier in the Red Army, whatever his uniform, however he serves, the training he receives is aimed at your destruction. image of communist troops as it has been fixed in the world's imagination. Hordes of men endlessly fed into the assault, filling the horizon as they surge forward in wave after wave of humanity. You know, people ask whether there was a real reason for the Cold War. Of course there was. Mr. Stalin had uh, given a speech, I think it was in February 1946, in which he called on the Russian people to uh, live through th three more five-year plans. And he said this was necessary for the eventual ability of the Soviet Union to deal with what he called any eventuality. And the rest of the speech made it clear that he didn't think that the Soviet Union would be safe as long as capitalism existed anywhere in the world. So this seemed to me to be a delayed declaration of war against the United States. You know what? I can speak for myself and for others. We believed in Stalin. And when people said, for the motherland, for Stalin, now they claim they didn't really mean it. They were forced to say that, well, perhaps. But ideology and propaganda could make me believe it. And my comrades also believed it. They believed in armored war right from the word go. As soon as they started getting tanks back in the 30s, they believed in this as a way of waging war. And they had a constant stream of development right the way through. The Soviets defeated Nazi Germany by relying on their surprisingly good tanks and their virtually limitless manpower. Now they applied their military might to the task of consolidating their gains in the post-war world. Their first priority was establishing a security zone around the Soviet republics. In other words, making sure that all the nations bordering the Soviet Union were controlled by puppet governments. The Soviets were not timid about crushing civilian resistance in these countries. In the Cold War era, the tank became a weapon of political terror used to subjugate reluctant members of the satellite states. To counter this threat and to respond to this challenge, 12 countries make an historic decision and take a fateful step. In Washington, D.C. on April 4, 1949, they signed the North Atlantic Treaty. The Pledge of Collective Action for Mutual Defense is undertaken as a deterrent to nuclear war and as a contribution toward lasting peace. By 1949, with NATO now in place, the Cold War had been institutionalized. The West did not feel the Soviets wanted a large-scale war with NATO, but they did believe that Stalin would support proxy wars fought by the USSR's many client states. My old boss, Scoop Jackson, uh, used the following metaphor. He said the Soviet Union, in its foreign policy, is like a hotel burglar walking down the corridor and turning the the handles of the doors. If he finds an open door, in he goes. And so the, the Soviets were always probing for weak spots, spots where they could expand their influence at minimal risk. They weren't big uh, risk takers. So that it was highly likely that the Russians were going to do something and test our will. And the question was where? <laughs> 
and uh, one of the places that looked likely was Korea. Following World War II, Korea, like Germany, had been divided and occupied by the U.S. and the USSR. The leaders of both North and South Korea yearned to crush the other side and unify their country. The North struck first. On June 1950, North Korean forces, armed with Soviet equipment, swept into the South. To the West, the invasion was a test case for containment. Soon, a United Nations task force was sent to South Korea to restore stability to Asia. But the North Koreans were joined by powerful allies of their own, troops from communist China, which had concluded its civil war just a year before. The Korean War was marked by extreme reversals of fortune for both sides. Fighting was bitter and bloody, prompting public arguments over whether the war should be fought with nuclear weapons or continue as a limited conflict. The war ended in stalemate in 1953. Now both sides turned their attention to Europe. Squabbles over territory and fears of invasion led the United States to increase its conventional forces and invest heavily in nuclear weapons. Everyone agreed that if the Cold War ever went hot, Europe would be the battleground. Well, it was generally supposed that uh, the Soviets would make a drive from the east to the west through northern Germany and through southern Germany, and probably operations in other parts of the world, and it was assumed this would be um, a massive armored attack uh, with air support. Yeah, they might come in any direction, it was just a question of how many they put into each area, that was all. I mean, a wide movement across the whole of Europe was anticipated. You had to plan for the, for the worst possible case, in fact. The tanks, followed by the armored infantry, move into the attack position. Signal for the assault will be the firing of an atomic burst. 15 seconds to zero. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. In the 1950s, the United States decided it could deter future Soviet aggression by building up a massive stockpile of nuclear arms. The atomic bomb was still new, and although it was assumed that a nuclear war would be catastrophic, the belief persisted that the U.S. could emerge victorious. A nuclear war could be winnable. In the future, it will need a main battle tank that will be faster and lighter with atomic firepower of its own. But while the U.S. planned for a high-tech war fought with atomic tanks, the Soviet Union continued to rely on brute force to crush its opponents. In 1956, the reformist premier of Hungary tested the post-Stalinist USSR by promising freedom of speech and withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact. The Soviets responded by sending in an invasion force to crush the revolution. I did my, my graduate study uh, at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, and it was very interesting at the time because this was one of the few areas in the world where uh, there were essentially Soviet peers, uh, and we could establish uh, basically a social relationship um, but it was, it was very interesting, I guess, and, and confirming in terms of, of, of the sense of the importance of the mission that I saw that I had as a, as a young uh, armored force uh, officer uh, was that as we would talk in conversation over a beer or what have you, and you'd get down to the basics of, of the responsibilities of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the state. And the more we knew each other, the more I knew that we were on fundamentally opposing courses and, and that it was something that, as a political philosophy, that was uh, an anathema to, to those things that I held very dear. On August 13, 1961, the Cold War reached another plateau. In order to block the flight of thousands of East Germans into West Berlin, 
Soviet and East German troops closed down inter-allied checkpoints and began building a wall that sealed off the western city. Once again, the armies of the East and West squared off for an attack and then thought better of it. The Berlin Wall stood for 18 years, an enduring symbol of the Cold War. At the heart of the Russian military machine is an intercontinental nuclear striking power, a power in which missiles are increasingly important. This striking power is not as great as that possessed by the United States, but it is formidable. In 1962, American spy planes discovered that the Soviet Union was building silos for 42 medium-range nuclear missiles on the island of Cuba. The presence of nuclear missiles so close to American soil set off a crisis that brought the superpowers to the brink of war. President John F. Kennedy was determined to force the Soviets to take the missiles out. Neither Kennedy nor Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev was anxious to start a third world war. But while they argued, the armies in Europe prepared for the worst. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had a very powerful tank grouping that consisted of almost 50,000 tanks. We had more than three times the number of troops NATO had in Europe. We did in fact have an attack strategy, though we didn't plan to attack, but we did have a strategy. And we planned an attack at the rate of a hundred kilometers a day. NATO forces were also placed on alert. But during the crisis, the forces on the east and west made deliberate efforts not to give false signals that a ground war was about to break out. Troops were pulled back to their barracks, and in general, both sides refrained from taking action that would inflame an already tense situation. By limiting the conflict to Cuba, the superpowers avoided catastrophe. Acting, therefore, in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere. The great genius of Kennedy's handling of that crisis was in focusing everything on the naval engagement and the quarantine of Cuba, where we had overwhelming superiority and that left the Soviets only with a nuclear choice. And we were so superior in nuclear terms that that was never a realistic proposition. The Cuban Missile Crisis proved that neither superpower wanted a nuclear war. It was time for both sides to rethink their doctrine. When one first got nuclear weapons, one was enchanted with the possibilities of the power that this would bring. And that progressively, as you replaced generations of missiles or generations of nuclear weapons, you discovered that there was very little you could do with them. In fact, you ended up sitting on them and trying to think of how you could reduce them because there was, in the end, very little influence that you could uh, have except to threaten Armageddon or a kind of retaliation which would have led to untold deaths and, in fact, destruction on both sides. So more and more the bias was put on the question of fighting an ordinary conventional war without nuclear, nuclear coming in only at the last resort. And that, of course, meant that you had to have far stronger conventional arms to deal with that situation. Hence, well, there's more drive behind the idea of developing superior weapons, of which the tank would be the dominant one. In armor, the Soviets were already decades ahead of the West. The T-62, introduced in the early 1960s, was superior in speed and firepower to anything fielded by the Americans. The Cuban Missile Crisis spurred the Soviets to launch a massive arms buildup to ensure that they kept their advantage and were ready for war. We expected NATO's troops to launch a strike after which Soviet troops would have to shift to the attack. And uh, the main instrument, the main type of weapon that was to be relied upon in a conventional war was, above all, our powerful tank grouping, in which we had a clear superiority over the enemy, both in a qualitative and quantitative sense. The Soviets were certainly outspending us a percentage of their gross national product versus ours by a substantial margin. We were spending about seven or eight percent of our 
GNP, our gross national product on defense, and they were in fact spending maybe 30 percent. The Soviet arms buildup did not go unnoticed, but by the mid-1960s, the United States was locked in an increasingly desperate campaign in Vietnam. Fighting a theoretical ground war in Europe was secondary. The U.S. focused on its high-tech advantage and hoped for the best. Well, every time we went out on an exercise, or every time we did a demonstration of firepower and range, the chances were we were being watched. And if you could show off something really spectacular, that was part of the deterrent. And sometimes we would spoof them, and sometimes they would spoof us. Accidentally, deliberately, it was a constant guessing game with the demonstrations interwoven with it. But in 1968, demonstrations once again gave way to brutal reality. Prague sleeps. And then it happens. The Soviet Union and several of her Warsaw Pact allies move ruthlessly to stamp out democratic socialism in Czechoslovakia a fellow member of the Warsaw Pact. The Soviets justified the invasion of Czechoslovakia by claiming that the USSR had the right to intervene in any communist state to prevent the success of counter-revolutionary elements. Once again, the Soviets proved more than willing to use tanks as instruments of social control. Still, the latest tanks to roll off Soviet assembly lines were built for conventional warfare. The T-64 and T-72 battle tanks were faster and more powerful than ever. They were built in great numbers, fueled by a military with an unrestricted budget. 2020 hindsight, it's obvious that it, that it was a system out of control, but I can assure you as you were looking at new pieces, of things that we could only dream of, they were basically producing in quantity, and your charge is to hold the line. That just absolutely gets your attention. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. The main difference, I believe, in the Reagan administration was that Ronald Reagan believed that the Soviet empire was vulnerable because of its economic failure. And he was determined to uh, reignite the ideological war. Certainly at the official level, it was about as cold in the early part of the 1980s as it was perhaps in the 1950s. A Red Army publication, for instance, maintains that the U.S. armed forces are, quote, training inveterate cutthroats, robbers, marauders, people without conscience and honor, brought up on ideas of bestial imperialist morals. Anybody here recognize G.I. Joe, alias Cutthroat Joe? The beer belly beast who eats babies for breakfast? As for the enemies of freedom, when those who Reagan are made that adversaries, comment about the evil empire. And the... later I talked to some of my Russian friends and they said that that was the most damaging statement that anybody had ever made. Because all of them knew that the accusation was true. <laughs> and so it had a huge effect in the Soviet Union. The Reagan administration pressed for large increases in defense spending. Programs that had been in development for years were now stepped up and funded for deployment. One priority was to replace the Army's aging fleet of M60 tanks with the new M1A1 Abrams tank. The new tanks would go straight to Germany and the NATO belt of defense. In the meantime, the venerable M60s were pitted against an overwhelming force of T-72s and T-80s. We were not only a generation behind in terms of equipment, but we were almost dead in the water in terms of getting new equipment started, and there was a tremendous momentum that was accruing, uh, particularly but not exclusively to the, to the Soviets. But so the first thing we had to do was to develop 
uh, equipment knowing that we were basically going to have one shot and this is what we were probably going to have for the next 20 to 25 years against which we had to beat the multiple simultaneous production capabilities of the Warsaw tank. After a history of always having the second best tank, the U.S. was determined to build a weapon that was faster, more powerful, and protected its crew better than anything else in the world. The result was the M1A1. But it was costly, and doubts about its performance persisted until the war in the Persian Gulf. Meanwhile, relations between the superpowers were at their lowest point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. The climate grew increasingly tense as a revolt in Poland was crushed, and cruise missiles were deployed in Western Europe. There was never a moment when uh, one felt that uh, you should get in the car and go back to the office because uh, war was about to break out uh, in, in Europe, although there were moments of very considerable tension. And I think we know from reliable uh, sources in the Kremlin at the time that there were moments when the Soviets thought that uh, war might be imminent. In 1985, the reform-minded Mikhail Gorbachev became Secretary General of the Communist Party. He took control of a superpower that outwardly seemed stronger than ever. But the Soviet Union was actually in dire trouble. Its economy was a shambles. Its people were broken and dispirited. Long ago, the utopian dream of selfish devotion to the common good had been replaced by the reality of a hated police state. Perhaps most significantly of all, the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan had turned into a 10-year quagmire that weakened the state and destroyed the invincible image of the Red Army. In Afghanistan, Soviet superiority in men and equipment proved useless. We felt that we had a great excess of tanks, and it turned out that the time for tanks had passed, that the role they had played during the Battle of Kursk and, in general, throughout the Great Patriotic War would never again apply. Suddenly, it all fell apart. The limited reforms Gorbachev permitted in the name of Glasnost spiraled out of control. One by one, the satellite states of the Soviet Empire fell away. Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany. Given a choice, the workers of the world opted to try their luck in the dangerous world of free market capitalism rather than live in a failed utopia. The fall of the Berlin Wall and the eventual reunification of Germany marked the final end of the Warsaw Pact and the Cold War. Now the last bastion of Soviet communism was the USSR itself. Gorbachev was determined to somehow save the USSR, but hardline forces blamed him for the dissolution of totalitarian order. So the hardliners launched a coup, but the army chose to support Russian President Boris Yeltsin instead. By December 25, 1991, the Soviet Union was dead. It's the return of, of profoundly held religious, ethnic beliefs, conflicts that have existed for centuries that are no longer repressed by the accumulated power of the two superpowers. And as they come out, it seems to me it's a far more dangerous world. So it's a dangerous world, and it will continue to be a dangerous world, but not nearly so dangerous as it was uh, when we faced the prospect of, uh, of a major uh, war with, uh, with a nuclear power. We cannot know the state of the Soviet man's heart today. Perhaps the worm of doubt works to undermine the faith that has been so carefully cultured. But we cannot assume it. The Russian we know is traditionally a patriotic man. Let us assume then that his patriotism today is undimmed.
Let us assume that men who are masters in the art of persuasion have done their job well. Let us assume that for the Soviet serviceman, his patriotism is bound up in the cause of communism itself, and he is a willing agent of the aggressive system he serves. Let us assume these things, for to do otherwise could be fatal.